it's a great pleasure to be back here. I think it's the fifth time that we're doing the conference here at the Ford Foundation, so I'm already very much used to that. It's part of the calendar. Um, and of course, the expectation is the same, which is that we're, we'll have uh, a lot of interesting discussions and also a lot of out-of-the-box thinking, which is not like not very usual to have them in a lot of the places where we have those big conferences. I think here is one of the places that we can take for granted that we'll, we'll have that. Uh, let me thank uh, Louise Dini and, and Maya Harris and Martina Brigu from the foundation and also uh, Dimitri and John and many, many other people who helped to make this happen. Uh, so this year I choose to say something to you about the, about the initiative in itself, a quick overview of the Reforming Global Financial Initiative uh, because this is the very import important component but it's not all that we're doing under this rubric. So I'm going to try to give you a quick sum up of this. First thing is that uh, as, as diagnostics, I think we came up with two diagnostics that were uh, quite, I would say, on the money. First one is that we have global markets, yes, especially in finance, but we don't have, and still in 2013, I think this is still valid, we still don't have global governance to oversee them. And the second piece of the diagnostics is that, pretty much an instant one, is that finance impacts everybody, impacts uh, all economic and social spheres. It's part of our daily lives, we like it or not. But the problem is that uh, those who are most influenced, uh, they are, they don't have much of a say in that. So. With these diagnostics, we came to our vision, and the vision, in a way, is also some sort of the solution for the problem, if you will. Well, what kind of solution? Well, the idea that bottom line, financial stability and financial security are global public goods. And in that sense, public institutions need to be the, the ones, the vehicles uh, by which leaders take public responsibility for the public interest. If we leave that to the markets, it doesn't work. If we leave that to the financial markets, it works even worse. And of course, financial crisis uh, was the crystal clear demonstration of that statement. Okay. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, and sharp sum up of the problem, the one that uh, Chelsea put, put down. Actually, it began with the ideas, the wrong ideas. I, I, I just would say not the wrong ideas of all economists, right? Some economists didn't have those ideas, but the mainstream had those ideas. And those ideas, they open up the space for the deregulation of finance, which led to the credit explosion, which led to the credit crunch. Interesting because uh, it's a statement in the spirit of both Keynes and Weber, in the sense that uh, we're talking about ideas as sources of power, which is an interesting, uh, an interesting point to remark. Okay, in a nutshell, what we have. Well, the goal, not surprisingly, is to try to improve, to help. We're not doing anything by ourselves. But the idea is to help improve a system of, of global, uh, or a global financial system which is more democratic, is transparent, is accountable, and to get finance back to where it, where it should be, meaning financial institutions providing finance for sustainable development, employment and employment opportunities uh, worldwide. In a saying, saying a bit differently, well, not finance working for itself, but finance as part 
of a bigger system and working towards development and working uh, in sync with the productive side of the economy. Well, more precisely, uh, we had three ideas in mind. Reform, reshape, and to resize the global financial system in order to empower uh, major civil society players, and that includes everybody, not only from NGOs, uh, and give them a credible voice, because this is the, we're, we're back to the diagnostics, no voice at all in terms of uh, how do we speak up against what's going on, what's wrong in the financial system. The problem comes when, okay, uh, we want that, how do we do it? Well, what we choose to do was to focus on three areas, basically, uh, regulation of domestic banks and private finance, uh, we could call this reorienting financial reform. The other thing would be to reform the legal foundations of international financial, of international finance and financial flow, which then we, can, we have to get from the banking system and from the financial system to international trade treaties especially the WTO, but not only, bilateral trade, trade agreements and a lot of others are, would, would also fall into that category. And then also uh, a public dimension of, of this, which is, uh, which is to uncover and publicize the role and the functions of the public financial system. Because as we saw in the crisis, not only in the US, UK, Europe, everywhere, it was the public financial system who really took charge in terms of bailing out the corporations, in terms of organizing the, uh, the way to fight the crisis. And if we look at places, sorry, like Brazil or China, well, it was because of the financial, uh, the public financial system that we, both countries didn't really have a financial crisis. So this is something that I think should be uh, underlined, should be underlined because it's not sufficiently debated, uh, at least the way I see it in the conversations since uh, the beginning of the crisis. Okay, uh, reorienting financial reform. Uh, if we look at uh, what was there in 2006 or pre-crisis, I would say, I would suggest financial chaos, right? Ninja loans, uh, fraud everywhere, credit rating agencies acting as global regulators. They're private, right? And they, they just give their opinion, nothing more than that. But they, in fact, were acting and still do act as global regulators. Uh, leverage ratios of 40 to 1, 50 to 1, uh, banks betting against their clients, the Paulson and Goldman Sachs and so many others uh, deal, deals that we, we should be well, looking at that and should be, wow, can this happen? It did happen. So uh, a few proposals there. So, synthetic leverage, of course, uh, leverage on top of leverage, derivatives. Uh, Contagion. So, a few proposals that are coming have they, they have come and, come and they are at the, they are in the table. They're being discussed. Some of them are in Dodd Frank. Some are not. But it's not rocket science. I would say it's more criminal law than rocket science, if you will. Uh, decrease leverage. Radically decrease leverage. Decrease synthetic leverage in terms of derivatives. Uh, develop a system of, of systemic risk regulatory apparatus to avoid contagion because the whole idea of regulation was to focus on individual corporations, individual banks. What about the system? Uh, closely supervise the big banks' balance sheets. Actually, uh, police the banks better. Uh, this is what we do, for example, I come from Brazil. In Brazil, 
there are not too many big countries, uh, big, big, big banks, sorry, it's a big country, but not, not uh, there's a few very big banks. Well, the central bank calls the banks very often to get a better understanding of what's going on. Can I see your balance? Something weird happened yesterday. I want to understand it. Well, it's, again, it's not rocket science. It's close supervision, close regulation, right? And of course, uh, the more difficult thing to do would be, uh, well, of course, uh, get rid of the, at least the way they are structured now, get rid of the uh, credit rating agencies or make them liable for what now are only their opinions. They should be liable about giving their opinions and obliging people to just sell or buy and buy and sell because they're not triple A anymore. The worst, the mo most difficult proposal, of course, is, well, it, it would be extremely useful, is deinstitutionalize lobbying because this system of governing by lobbying is clearly not the best one. It's not effective, it, I would say, it's not even uh, democratic. On a positive note, I think we can say that, well, obviously the task is not over, but <coughs> some reforms are being implemented. Dodd-Frank is being implemented. There is a lot of controversies about that. Alan Blinder, which is gonna be, I believe, speaking here, just published a book, a very interesting book, which is a little bit more optimistic than other statements in terms of what can what Dodd Frank can bring. Well, it's it's a debate, but anyway, reforms are there. But I think that the whole thing it still still has to to be deeper. Uh, more radical reforms, I think, are are still needed to get the system back where it should be. Okay, uh, the legal foundations. Let's stick with reforming the WTO financial rules. What is the, what is the problem there? Well, the problem is that if we look at international trade right now, it has become much more complicated than the, the idea of trading in goods. Well, it's mostly trading in services, intellectual property and other kind of services, and more and more financial services, right? And financial services, unregulated trade in financial services creates risk, increases volatility. Okay, you can see that there is a lot of that, and banks are at the forefront of these movements. But they rarely, there is no study that really states their contribution for development. So it's basically a speculative game. So speculative capital movements continue to grow fast. And again, let me repeat, the banks are at the forefront of that. So to, reg to properly regulate the banks and the financial and private finance, you have to get into the international trade treaties which allow that to happen. So that is a very important link in between two pieces of financial reform that I think have to be more profoundly uh, Study it if you want, but especially advocate it. So uh, domestic policy space, because of those binding rules of international trade treaties, domestic policy space has shrunk. There is a problem in that, right? You can see that in the Eurozone, you can see that everywhere, you can, you can see that in every single bilateral trade agreement and in the GATS provisions under the WTO. On the other hand, policy space for corporations increased tremendously. They can move their money all over the place as they wish. So there is a mismatch there, right? Uh, what has to be done? One of the things is obviously, but just now this conversation is getting more serious, is to make the management of capital flows, a core uh, rule or piece of <coughs> international finance of, or international regulation, right? 
uh, to require quarantine periods uh, for capital inflows and capital outflows, to delink trade agreements from financial liberalization. But in order to do that, so this is the, in order to do that, reforms at those international, the reforms of those international uh, trade agreements are necessary because the mismatch is that. Uh, there is a consensus, sort of, a consensus emerging, at least in terms of the usefulness of regulating cross-border financial flows, but the commitments inside the major uh, international trade agreements still are very much in terms of deregulating them. So this is a mismatch that obviously has to has to change. Okay, the third one, shaping financial, like the public, the public dimension of the initiative, shaping or reshaping, if you will, financial institutions for innovation and development. Okay, if we look at the post, not a pre-crisis, but the post-crisis uh, situation in the West, well, you can see no or very few job creations, right? Uh, austerity policies are undermining the recovery in, in, in Europe, but also here, in a way, uh, speculative finance is, again, on the top of the game. You can see that the earnings are back, but the employment is, is lagging. Uh, and investment and growth, BRICS are obviously, the BRICS are obviously a new player in that scene, which doesn't see the sort of casino capitalism way of doing things with the same uh, sympathy or empathy than others do. So this is the, the, the BRICS are a clear demonstration of a new, a different deal in terms of how uh, the state and how public, how, uh, how the public financial system works with private finance and in a way uh, subsumes uh, private finance to the goals, the major goals of development, innovation, and employment creation. Uh, if you look at this, well, even again, uh, pre-crisis, there is a big difference, of course, that we, we, we all know. Uh, where is the growth? The growth is in Asia, and especially the growth is in China. Well, and so again, Asia and BRICS, they tell us that we have new players uh, in the scene. New players where, again, let me repeat, where the public financial system is at the forefront of crafting industrial strategy and financing development projects. So the best responses to the crisis were Brazil and China, right? What do they have in common? Capital controls, robust financial regulation, and strong public financial systems. So BRICS collaboration is growing. China Development Bank, uh, BNDES, those are public banks, development banks. And uh, if you will, and the this is one of the uh, covers of The Economist last year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, a new form of state capitalism, state capitalism might be emerging you like it or not. And if you look uh, at that picture, well, in a way, the question I'm posing is, is there a BRICS plus uh, development deal which is much more, leaning much more towards uh, public financial institutions? I would say there's a good chance. And if you look at that picture, who looks like the banker? Well, who is the banker actually? Well, it's China, right? China is the U.S. banker right now. So very quickly to some uh, results, results that, they achieved, uh, that, that we achieved. Uh, first thing, in order to go to a global initiative like that, we had to network. We had to network, and those are just a few of the projects that we have, and they are working together. Since the beginning, they are working together, which gives them leverage in terms of trying to achieve, uh, uh, to get some ideas uh, at the table, right? Right now, uh, uh, the initiative uh, in January 2013 is 
has 32 active grantees in 13 countries with ramifications for uh, more than 20 countries if we, if we take it all together in, in four continents. So it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting achievement. Another one, which was, uh, and the projects are uh, joint ventures, most, most of them. Another one was that we had a successful start. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, we helped her uh, in the very beginning of her crusade with the Financial Product Safety Commission. And this, I think, was nice because now she, she's a senator and this is already legislation. Okay, uh, in terms of the third, third set of impacts, I think that since 2006 or seven, we're, we have been advocating for that idea that the public financial system is a critical uh, agent, a critical player in terms of how to uh, fund innovation and development, not only in the South, if you will, but also in the U.S. and the whole and, and, and in Europe. So uh, several of those projects are are dealing with that. And okay, what I think we can claim is that four years ago, the idea that the private financial system was getting out of control and that needed to be reshaped by the visible hand of the government was not at the table. And now I think it's sort of current thinking, and I think that this initiative uh, contributed uh, for that uh, change in the conversation. I think we're not reinventing the wheel. I think uh, both Lula and Jin Tao, they were both empowered in 2003. They sort of knew something about that. Uh, again, let's remind that in both China and Brazil, the public financial system is was always and still is quite robust. And this is something to think about. Finally, well, believe it, the Minsky's, the Minsky conference clearly became a global place or a place for globally oriented policy dialogues. So in that sense, and I have to thank you. I have to thank you. Uh, I, I owe you a big thank you because you helped to, you, know, you, you did it, you produced that. And now I think what, what's happening is that you're helping to push for the implementation of a more progressive uh, financial reform. And we get to the end just raising a few lessons very quickly. The most important of, one, uh, 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 of them, I think that it's the third one, it's that it takes money in politics to confront money, money in politics. Meaning, the whole thing of lobbying is devastating in the sense that we don't have the same tools. So we can be smart, we can have a first class team, but it helps. But it's very difficult to fight this governing by lobbying sort of uh, not only financial system, but this poses a problem, I would say, <laughs> even for democracy, right? And if we ask the ultimate question in terms of the test, are we safe? Let me just remind you of Gretchen Morganson in New York Times uh, last week. No, we're not safe. Be afraid. And she's not talking about 2008 or 9. It's, to, it's, it's 13, right? Financial system, thanks to disabling tra traders and bumbling regulators, is at greater risks than you know. So with that in mind, uh, I want to thank you again. I want to wish all of us a great conference. And I want to ask Dimitri to properly introduce the conference itself. Let's begin. Thank you very much. I too want to, first of all, good morning. I too want to welcome you to the Levy Institute's 22nd annual Hyman Minsky Conference on this year on the theme on building a financial structure for a more stable and equitable economy. I certainly want to thank 
the Ford Foundation and especially Leonardo Burlamaki for making us part of this great initiative. Also to thank him for his guidance and also for making it possible for us to use again for the fifth year um, the Ford Foundation headquarters to host, to have this conference. Of course, um, my thanks also don't stop here. I must mention my senior colleague and senior scholar, Jan Kregel, who uh, runs our project, our research project on financial structure and monetary policy for putting this conference together along with me. Every year we find that many more colleagues in the academy, Wall Street, and the policymaking arena recognize Minsky's important theoretical contributions to economics in helping us understand the workings of the modern and complex capitalist economy. The Levy Economics Institute continues to sharpen its focus on strategic issues of economic policy relating to achieving long-term economic growth and higher employment in a period of low inflation, decreasing public expenditures in research and development, education, and other public goods. We continue our research and writings and outreach on monetary and fiscal policies, on systemic risk, and reform of financial services sector and the evolving structure of regulation necessitated from the advances of financial innovation. The Levy Institute Ford Foundation project offers policy proposals for, for reforming the financial structure drawing from Minsky's research and writings that we have at the Levy Institute in the archives. We are very pleased to report that aside from the Institute's scholars, more than 3,000 visitors have drawn um, their uh, support from the Minsky archive. There have been many downloads of published and unpublished papers that are contained in the archive. Our web traffic has surpassed the 800,000 page views per month. It has been almost three years since the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act was passed, with the struggle over its shape still ongoing. Dodd-Frank is based on the idea that financial markets are normally stable with the exceptional alarming event. The New Deal's Glass-Steagall Act and the Clinton era graham leach Bliley modernization shared those assumptions. All of these efforts were conceived as system-wide overhauls. In reality though, they were designed only to remedy random ad hoc crises but not the shocks like the 2008 meltdown, otherwise known as Minsky moment. Ironically, Hyman Minsky actually believed that these moments were anything but random or ad hoc. The increasingly risky practices that fuel danger and instability are still happening and being rewarded and the shocks will still come in. Each new threat to stability is destined to be different from the last. Dodd-Frank aims to identify the most vulnerable institutions and practices. That approach is too brittle to contain the disastrous effects of risks that are always morphing. Even, construct, even constructive aspects of the act could have perverse consequences unless the rules are subject to sophisticated re-examination as the finance world develops. 
banks carry an urge to evolve in a way that maximizes revenues. We are frequently witnessing how quickly markets create newer, riskier, and more profitable instruments. In the very, it is the very nature of modern finance to transform its structure in response to the prevailing regulation and to evade it successfully. Under Dodd-Frank, banks will function more or less as they did in the past. Their enormous size and multi-function operations will be subject only to trivial changes. The Act's most significant measure, the Volcker Rule, continues to be diluted, and many of its other regulations are tied up in delays. Instead of fundamental changes, that, that would caution our fragile system from instability, that Frank's centerpiece is limit on the use of public funds to rescue failing banks. The act, by enabling rapid dissolutions, it aims to avoid a repeat of 2008, when the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy virtually froze, excuse me, capital markets. It is also an understandable response to TARP, which recapitalized insolvent financial institutions at a great cost while allowing failing households to fall into foreclosure. But limiting taxpayers' exposure to the next bank breakdown is, this, is not the same as preventing a system-wide collapse. Tweaking that frank isn't a solution. Glass-Steagall contains features worth preserving, but reviving an outdated and infeasible law will not help. Neither will blaming Graham Leach blindly, which profound as it was, merely reflected the new status quo of its day. It institutionalized the changes that had already emerged in the markets. We need banks that can earn competitive rates of return while they focus not on the big risks or the big deal, but on financing capital development. Reforms that promote enterprise and industry over speculation will have to be innovative, flexible, and opportunistic at the markets they aim to improve. Minsky had proposed, and Jan Kregel, my colleague, will discuss tomorrow, that regulators could begin by breaking down banks into smaller units. A bank holding company structure with numerous types of subsidiaries each one subject to strict limitation on the type of permitted activities would be a valuable deterrent to risky behavior. Restrictions on the, side, on the size and function would allow a reasonable shot at understanding esoteric subsidiaries and a chance to react quickly to mutations. Finally, Minsky long argued that there is complementarity between financial stability and full employment. Indeed, this was the main objective of Minsky's research at the Levy Institute. His proposal for financial stability was to shift the emphasis from capital-intensive investment growth to investment in jobs as a means of ensuring both stability and an equitable income distribution. Employment, Minsky argued, should be the major objective of economic policy with government acting as an employer of last resort. A direct, federally funded employment guaranteed program, one providing a job opportunity to any individual willing and able to work would act as an automatic economic stabilizer, enabling households to meet their financial commitments and subsequently reducing the impact of financial shocks. The purpose of this year's conference is to explore this linkage further. As you have undoubtedly noticed, the Levy Institute has come out with a new book 
the title of which is Ending Poverty, Jobs, Not Welfare, describing the government's larger and more proper role. The book contains Minsky's published and unpublished papers on the subject. We invite your close scrutiny and would welcome your comments. Thank you very much for coming and I hope you enjoy the conference.